Number one, Ibble Dibble here. Hello, friends. Because I've been thinking a lot about fashion lately, I thought it might be interesting to revisit Megan's British Vogue guest editorship in light of Edward Enenful's recent polite demotion from his role as British Vogue's editor in chief. And of course, Dior's denial of working with Megan as a brand ambassador. Everyone loved Max Mara until Megan made their designs look like shapeless felt bags. Carolina Herrera was a socialite staple until the burst tomato dress. And who could forget Megan single handedly ruining Givenchy with her ill fitting wedding gown? Accompanied by equally poorly turned out little bridesmaids, personally and explicitly described by the Princess of Wales, one of the best dressed European royals, as completely foobar. Megan is a luxury house poison and Dior doesn't plan on being a willing victim. This is a deep dive. This is a multi-video series. This might be a multi-hour series. I'm still working on it. So I'm going to post it in parts and put them in a playlist. As with all of my long videos, this one is divided into chapters. Timestamps are in the description box. Part one, Edward Enenful's come up. Let's talk about Edward Enenful, the man who recognized Megan's intrinsic talents for artful composition of both moving prose and aesthetically striking photographs, and didn't hire her based on her skin color and social status as a duchess at all, of course not. Edward Enenful, like Misan Harriman, is not a black Brit who presumably experienced some feelings of otherness, if not outright discrimination, due to being an ethnic minority in his youth. He is a Ghanaian born into considerable privilege as the son of an army major under a corrupt military dictator. He became British at the age of 13 when granted asylum in the UK during that dictator's overthrow. It really makes you think, who should the UK be granting asylum to? The wealthy henchmen of corrupt dictators who themselves helped overthrow democratically elected governments not 15 years prior? Hmm. Edward has described his teenage years in Labrook Grove as penniless. For the Londoners among you, he got there in 1985. So that's how Enenful got into the UK. How did he get into fashion? Edward has one of those Cinderella discovery stories. For some reason, it's uncouth to say your insane stage parents engineered the family's whole life around your pursuit of stardom, or you fucked the right people pretty early on in life, or your dad or his bestie are in the C-suite, or a combination of the three. <laughs> Edward's story is that aged 16, he he was model scouted on the tube by famous stylist Simon Foxton. A few weeks later, he was shooting with Foxton at his house, along with Nick Knight, the co-founder and photographer of bi-monthly magazine ID. By the age of 17, he had been introduced to Terry Jones, another co-founder of ID, and soon began assisting the magazine's fashion director, Beth Summers. Summers left the magazine a few weeks after Annenfeld's 18th birthday, and Terry Jones gave Annenfeld the position. Hmm. What do you think? I don't doubt Simon Foxton picked him up on the tube. I do doubt it was for modeling. I think it's pretty obvious young Edward was not the missing link between Charles Williamson and Tyson Beckford. Beth Summers got into a literally catastrophic crash during Milan Fashion Week in 2000. At just the age of 37, she was incapacitated both physically and in terms of brain damage to the degree that she requires round-the-clock care and will for the rest of her life. Otherwise, I'd be very curious to hear what she had to say, although she might not remember anyway. Other people have described not remembering working at ID or loaded at all due to the shocking amount of partying everyone did. Now let's talk about how he rose up the ranks. What I can only call blockbuster novelty shoots. His first hit was the July 2008 Italian Vogue Black Issue, which is exactly what it sounds like. For the March 2009 issue of ID, he did Best British, picking the most iconic 12 British supermodels, which of course was much discussed for 
who is excluded rather than who is included. Black and blockbuster sounds like a recipe for success in America, right? So he was hired on by US Vogue, but didn't gain any traction there. He moved laterally to W Magazine, where he increased the media by substantially, with popular shoots featuring Kate Moss dressed as a nun, Nicki Minaj dressed as Madame de Pompadour, and Carmen Carrera, a popular trans drag performer. Before Drag Race, the show took off and drag became more or less mainstream. Carmen Carrera participated in season three. I'm not saying Enninful doesn't have an eye. I'm saying his art is not what got him where he is. And I'm not saying Enninful doesn't genuinely care about diversity and inclusion. I'm saying he himself experienced few if any setbacks due to his color and sexual orientation. And he is clearly okay with packaging and marketing blackness and gayness as novelty products to a majority straight white female consumer. Part 2. Double Double Toil and Trouble let me set the scene. It's late 2016. H&M are planning their wedding. People on both sides of the Atlantic are wildly blaming racism for society's ills, not the exponentially accelerating polarization of wealth and crystallization of power within a government and media controlling plutocracy. And that plutocracy is keeping the public distracted and divided by fanning the flames, selling the people all the flavors of outrage, blame, and arguments over over meaningless labels they can dream up while going about their business buying politicians and government contracts at home and abroad. Celebrities have almost wholly co-opted the Black Lives Matter movement to burnish their own images while doing very little to politically or financially support the cause or the community. And corporations are scrambling to make diversity hires, but not really in terms of giving actual underprivileged people of color new opportunities. No, no, it's much faster and simpler to just promote the already relatively privileged coincidental or token employees of color into highly visible roles and plaster that all over the news. The use of terms like woke, sexism, intersectionality, racism, and colonists have risen sharply, while the use of terms like diversity and inclusion have leveled off or dropped. Perhaps most disturbingly, the usage of the term fake news has shot off the charts. British Vogue's ex-editor-in-chief, Alexandra Shulman, was not only ousted from her role of 25 years in this wave of social upheaval, but was publicly accused of racism by Edward using her cover model statistics. He famously said that in 25 years, only 12 people of color appeared on British Vogue's cover. You know me, I went back and counted. I should put in a footnote here. I'm talking about visibly non-white or not fully white because that's what people see in the 10 seconds they spend scanning a newsstand in a train station. It's actually 13 models or celebrities of color on 21 covers. Obviously, the demographics of the UK changed over the 25 years that Alexandra Shulman edited Vogue. A statistician might graph yearly comparisons, but I don't think there's any need. It's pretty clear that the percentage of people of color covering Vogue was below their proportion of the UK population in any given year, except for 2017, Alexandra's last year at the magazine, when people of color appeared on five out of her 11 covers. I wonder if that was a mea culpa, an attempt to save face, or trying to prove some sort of spiteful point. My impression, having reviewed the list of cover models a few times while I was counting, was that some ethnic minority groups were actually overrepresented relative to their proportion of the British population and others underrepresented. For example, of the 21 covers featured people of color, 14 of those feature people with some sub-Saharan African heritage. A further two feature women of North African descent. Zero. Zero in 25 years feature anyone of South Asian heritage, according 
to the gov.uk ethnicity facts and figures section, 9.3% of the UK population identifies as Black, Black African, Black Caribbean, Black other, mixed white, Black African, or mixed white, Black Caribbean. While 6.9% of the UK population identifies as Bangladeshi, Indian, or Pakistani, plus further unaccounted for people of mixed heritage, those ethnicities mixed with white or black or what have you, who did not get their own box to check on the 2021 census. Similarly, 3.1% of the UK population identifies as Chinese, Asian other, or mixed white slash Asian. Meanwhile, Alexa Chung, in my opinion, the most boring woman of all time, got four out of the 21 covers dedicated to models of color. So what was really going on here? Was it really Alexandra's personal racism? Was it structural racism at Vogue? Was it classism? Was it just Sloney set tribalism that may or may not be somewhat implicitly racist? I mean, Sienna Miller landed six solo covers with Alexandra. That to me is an equally what the fuck statistic. Then, clearly not knowing or maybe just not caring, she was in the danger zone. Alexandra published a group portrait of her entire Vogue editorial staff in her final issue. Just over 50 people, maybe one or two North Africans or Southeast Asians, zero Black people, zero East Asians. As you can imagine, the reaction was not good. It went viral on Twitter and there were thousands of comments debating what this meant in terms of structural racism in the UK, but I think this one sums them up nicely. In a city as diverse as London, the only explanation is prejudice. It's also commercially ignorant. What do you think? I can forgive Alexandra <laughs> for torturing us with multiple covers of Alexa Chung and Sienna Miller if they sell, if they're the ones selling the magazine. I don't relate, but okay. I have a much harder time with this staff. So how did Alexandra defend herself? Part three, the color of money. She gave a now infamous interview to The Guardian probably the day after she left, November 10th, 2017. Her final issue had been on the stands for two weeks. Quote, I do find it offensive, this idea that there was this kind of posh cabal who weren't doing anything. The idea that we were having a kind of tea party when we made literally hundreds of millions of pounds as profit, I find offensive. Over the years, there have been people of all kinds of ethnicities in the magazine. On that particular day, there was nobody there, and you know, it's frustrating. Whenever non-white candidates applied, I'd say they almost always did, in fact, get the job. But relatively few came up through the pipeline for whatever reason, so that might account for why there weren't more. I guess I have to hold my hand up and say I don't encourage positive discrimination in any area. I've never been somebody who's box ticked. I'm against quotas. I feel like my Vogue had the people in who I wanted it to. I didn't look at what race they were. I didn't look at what sex they were. I didn't look at what age they were. I included the people I thought interesting. Ibel margin note. Fuck. <laughs> Alexa Chung. Sienna Miller and Natalia Vodianova are the people you find interesting? That's a more shocking statement and a more transparent lie than anything you had to say about accidental or purposeful racism. Back to you, Alex. If you're going to say to me, well, how many white models as opposed to how many black models were in there? I'm sure you can make the numbers stack up to argue that there was an issue. But as far as I'm concerned, there wasn't and it never entered my head. The idea that I'm racist, I do mind about that. I can't pretend I don't. Vogue always sold on the newsstand and people have to recognize the person you're putting on the cover. I was judged by my sales. That was my remit. My chief remit was not to show ethnic diversity as a policy. If you put a black face on the cover who is not instantly recognizable, you sell fewer copies. It's as simple as that. I am upset by accusations of racism. I haven't got a racist bone in my body, and it does infuriate me. I think Enenful's first full issue looks great. That is meant genuinely. I'm sure this issue will sell, but you can lie and say everything's lovely, or you can be honest and then reap the consequences of that. If I say yes, I was pleased, and then a lot of my staff lost their jobs, it sounds very disloyal. If I say no, I wasn't pleased, then it sounds very rude. The answer is that I think Edward was a good idea. 
I would really like it on record that I do not have any axe to grind with Edward. I'm absolutely sure Edward will do really well. He's the right guy at the right time. I'm sure that Condé Nast will be delighted. I really am. Obviously, you don't want people to do things a great deal better than you did them. So if he doubles Vogue sales overnight, well, that would be very frustrating. Unquestionably frustrating. End quote. And this was Edward's response. Quote, she represented a different time. I just thought, let me bring in a new world. Let's create a magazine that was inclusive and everybody could see themselves in, end quote. When Edward took the reins, he immediately fired lots of people, including the fashion director, and hired on enough people of color to make up 25% of his staff. People of color make up 18% of the population of the UK, not 25%. Do you think it's possible or necessary to make up for lost time in this way? Or do you think this was a game of optics where Edward and Vogue threw Alexandra under the bus? At the time when the handover took place five years ago, everyone thought Shulman was just wrong. They thought her understanding of Vogue's customer was wrong, and they felt her attitude was wrong in not having faith in an if you build it, they will come strategy for British Vogue. And at first, it seemed like Shulman was wrong. In Enenful's first year as editor-in-chief, Vogue circulation rose 1.1%, while Lifestyle and Fashion magazine circulation fell 6% on average in the UK. However, five years on, the circulation of competing magazines is up. Harper's, for example, is up 5%, while Vogue is down 3%, and Enenful is out. But not fired. Now that would be terrible. What if Edward accused Anna of racism? No, no, they created a role just for him. To quote Edward, he's stepping into the newly appointed position of editorial advisor of British Vogue and global creative and cultural advisor of Vogue, where I will continue to contribute to the creative and cultural success of the Vogue brand globally while having the freedom to take on broader creative projects, end quote. Industry translation? Vogue's basically paying for his silence and they'll call him when they need him. What they're paying for that silence is a whole lot less than what he made as an editor-in-chief, so of course he's free to take on the extremely lucrative commercial styling work he did before joining the magazine. The total optimist in me wants to believe that the new houses are wide-eyed progressives who really think Edward is so smart and sensitive. He can promote Vogue as a diverse luxury brand worldwide, despite having very little prior international experience and none outside Europe and the US. The realist in me sees that they are cost-cutting. They've got 26 international editions now, and editors-in-chief are like non-royal dukes. When the last one dies, the line is extinct. In 2016, Condé Nast CEO Bob Sauerberg notified employees that they were completely restructuring the company and reorganizing into five groups, business, editorial, research, technology, and creative, each with its own leader. To quote Sauerberg, Quote, we are working hard to evolve our company from a premium publishing company to a premium media company. These new contemporary structures will make it easier to collaborate across edit, business, and brand to brand. End quote. In a bid to reduce salary expenses by a full 20%, they laid off anyone who wasn't really necessary and offered everyone else a small buyout in exchange for voluntary resignation. In 2020, they gave Enenful the task of overseeing French, Italian, German, and Spanish Vogue while answering to Anna Wintour in New York, meaning that nowadays when you buy Italian Vogue, for example, what you're asking actually getting is a copy-paste product. It's got its own cover, but most of the content is from American Vogue, some from British Vogue, some from other international editions, with just a small piece of it devoted to Italian designers, celebrities, and parties that aren't globally famous. There is no longer an editor-in-chief. There's a local head of editorial content who answers to Edward, who answers to Anna. They do less, they get paid less, their staff gets paid less, and they're much more easily replaceable. The same way Edward is now the feudal lord of all Western European Vogue editions, Leslie Sun is the editorial director of APAC, Asian Pacific Vogues, Vogue Japan, China, Thailand, Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore. The cynic in me realizes 
that Vogue does not care about diversity. For them, it's just an excuse to cut their cost of goods sold. Why hire a South Asian Brit for anything when you can just copy paste an article from Vogue India? Why worry about diversity in a photo shoot when you can just snag one from Vogue Brazil? And Edward was the right color in the right place at the right time, saying the right things. And even though he kind of messed up their numbers, they're not going to fire him. If that doesn't describe historic patterns of job discrimination, I don't know what does. That's it for part one. I hope I've set the stage for what was going on at Vogue right before Megan showed up and why they may have been interested in working with her. Please join me tomorrow for part two. Toodles! Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Um.